If life is a mystery waiting to be solved, why do people keep seeking solutions in all the wrong places? Haven't you heard? The answers lie within. Master alchemist Debbie Unterman believes she has the key. After four decades of delving into people's minds, she's here to help you discover the secret. The journey begins by learning to love the voices you hear in your head. What are we waiting for? Let's begin. Here's Debbie. Hello, everybody. This is Debbie Unterman with Love of the Voices on Bold Brave TV. And I'm glad to be here with you. I'm wearing a different pair of glasses today. They're very much like the, they're not my regular glasses. They're my old glasses. But um, I put them on and I think I can see better in them. I don't know what happens. My eyes get worse. So what used to be for distance, now becomes for reading. And the ones that I have been wearing, um, I, I did because they didn't reflect as much. So if these start to reflect the light too much, I will change them and nobody will notice probably. <laughs> but I'm glad to be with you. I want to talk today about some new things that I've been learning about trauma. Um, there's something that they are now calling the functional freeze. I keep I keep learning all these these new terms. Uh, what I say is the work that I've been doing has actually tracked 100% with the latest brain science that's only been coming out since about 2010, 2012, you know, maybe a little bit in the early 2000s. I've been doing my work since 1983. That was in the days before they even thought that brain cells could be repaired, that the, the nerve cells die, that's it, you're stuck, they'll never grow back. And ta-da, we thought they would, and we had ways of doing that. And now everybody knows about it. it. It's just the new neuroscience, right? Is that, oh, guess what? There, there is um, a, a way to create new neurological pathways. And we were saying that we were calling it doing something we call running and changing incidents. And by going back to the root, you were able to change what was. And people like to say you can't change the past, but you actually can. The, the subconscious mind is an amazing place and anything is possible in it. And the proof is that things are different. You really do change. So it's not just all in the head it actually happens. I, I like, um, I mean, this is not really neuroplasticity or is it? When I worked with a smoker once and I was staying at his house and after we finished the session and I gave him the suggestions that he would no longer, you know, want to smoke at all. And as he was leaving the house, this was in LA, he he was like touching his his shirt pocket and going something am i missing something he had literally forgotten to put his cigarettes into his shirt pocket that's how quickly that changed and yeah that's a habit uh another smoking session smoking client i did this was a demo in class and after the session we all went to lunch <clears throat> and when i had tried to program to him because it's really good in order to stop smoking. There's two things that are really good. One is deep breathing. And I'm going to talk more about breathing and breath today. But another is drink lots of water. You want to flush, you know, take walks, do baths uh, to, to release toxins. 
And so drinking water is really important. And during the session, he said, I hate water. And yet when we went to the restaurant, he ordered water. <laughs> so we really can create changes in the brain and we can grow back neurons in the brain. That's called neuroplasticity now. There's a word for it. But I digress. One of the things that I have noticed is, is a pattern that's emerging between the new trauma work, like the freeze that comes with fight flight. And then they have added the states that I talked about a few weeks ago called attach, cry for help, collapse, submit, and please and appease. And now all of a sudden they're talking about this functional freeze state, which makes sense, but all the words that seem to come together when we talk about this are attachment, being able to be regulated. That means that you can regulate your own emotions instead of being dysregulated, which is when your emotions rule you and how it's connected with attachment from birth uh, you know, having a good attachment figure, not just the mother that breastfeeds you or, you know, immediately when you're born, but also as you're growing up. And also breath, like I just mentioned, breathing. Babies know how to breathe, right? They're really good at breathing. They're really good at crying and just letting it all out of their lungs. But as they begin to grow up and get socialized, they meaning we in childhood, all of a sudden crying isn't so socially appropriate at different times. And asking for your needs the way a baby does, you know, wow, I'm hungry, wow, I'm tired, wow, I'm wet, you know, feed me, change me, put me to bed, or I'm going to fight and not want to go to bed, but actually that's what I really need. So I'm just going to cry about it. You know, I'll be a cry baby. Well, soon you understand the word cry baby. You know, I had one actual session with a with a male client who went back to a time because we we go back to the original incidents in order to heal things and he went back to a time when he had soiled his diaper because he was still in diapers and he got punished and yelled at by his father for being such a baby. Uh, what's wrong with that picture, right? So there's a lot of things that are said to us that stop us from our natural expression that again, babies know how to do, animals know how to do, right? We know when they're in distress and they know how to heal themselves too. But humans need other people. And a lot of times the people have not had it done right to them, right? It, it started at the beginning and it just perpetuates. It goes intergenerationally and you see families that have the same dysfunction. Now, functional families, dysfunctional families, that has been talked about since the 80s, really, with John Bradshaw, when the whole inner child first came up. 
but things change, new, new concepts come up. And I really like this concept of the functional freeze that I want to talk about today a little bit, because what what it's saying is, you know, I've been talking about now for years and teaching, oh, it's not just fight flight anymore. It's fight flight freeze. But like I said, in the write up, we don't become statues, right? We don't become like I'm thinking Rocky horror picture show who has seen that. And when Frank and Furter, when they're all at the pool and he just kind of shoots something at them and they all, freeze they literally become statues that's what i was picturing when i wrote that they become like white statues in that exact position that they were in when he shot them with whatever froze them Uh, so when we talk about the free state we're not talking about somebody who is frozen literally i first heard the the term functional freeze I didn't quite get it. Now I see what it means. It means you have gone into that freeze state, which is very close to the dissociative state. And that means you know how to leave your body. You can lose time. You can go into that place of spaciness or, you know, highway hypnosis where you just kind of keep driving and you don't realize that you've passed your exit because you were somewhere else. Someone was driving the car, but it wasn't really you. So who is it? Well, I look at drivers a lot on the road and I especially look at the ones who are driving slow because I am kind of a little race car driver on the road. Sorry about that for any people who, uh, pass me or I pass them, I should say. But, you know, I can't believe how people can just block the highway because I know they've gone into some kind of state and they're not, they're not thinking about the road like I am. I love driving so much that I'm always thinking. Um, I'm looking at all the cars on the road. I'm expecting, oh, there's a truck that's driving. It's going to go up a hill soon. It's going to slow down. That car behind it is going to get stuck behind it. It's going to want to come in front of me. So I better pass it fast before it wants to. And I mean, I'm always thinking. I'm kind of doing physics and assuming that with the acceleration and the vectors and you know as you go down the road you just know if if you're going at a certain rate and somebody is is at that rate you can accelerate and pass them and the only thing that would mess that up is if all of a sudden they kind of wake up and they decide to accelerate right then too but usually you you know you can tell their personality type by how they've been driving and you know you have time to pass them that's why i feel very safe when i'm driving i'm sure that people who drive with me don't always know that i am totally conscious when i'm in a car if i ever zone out i can understand how if, if I'm going slow, you know that I am not totally in my body. I'm not thinking about driving. And that's what scares me because I see it all the time. But you know what I really like to, to see when I turn around and I look to see, um, why was that person going so slow? What were they doing? And they're almost always on the phone not just like looking at their gps for directions but talking because do you know that when you talk your attention is taken and you can't be thinking about driving and about the road and about who you're slowing down behind you because you're in the left lane or you know there's cars piling up behind you and and this is something I'm going to say, and people are going to disagree with me, but I have to tell you, this is brain science. Everyone thinks <clears throat> that they can multitask. And I will tell you, 
you're not going to believe me. There's no such thing as multitasking. And I, I multitask. But what you're doing, and it's easier, the younger you are, the easier it is because your brain still has a few more neurons in it anyway. Um, You're actually switching really fast. You're switching from one thing to another. And I prove this to myself because now I have a DVR when I watch TV and I also try to read at the same time. I know I've missed the show. And I prove it to myself because I go back and I go, oh, no, I did not hear that at all. So I'm fooling myself if I think I can multitask. It ends up with you doing things twice because you can't. Okay, so we're going to go away. And you know what? When we come back, I'm going to do something fun. I have a list of things that my dad sent in a newsletter <clears throat> that are statistics from 100 years ago, 103 years ago, 1910. And we're going to look at some contrasts in what's going on now in life compared to then. And they are pretty eye opening. So, again, Debbie Unchman with Love the Voices on Bold Brave TV. Thank you for tuning in on your favorite streaming network. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. What if there were a super tiny device? could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair. What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hello, this is Debbie Anderman with Love the Voices. Glad to have you with me. And like I said, I want to do something kind of fun right now. I want to read this list and kind of discuss, you know, if you want to call in, you're free to discuss with me. I would love that. But right now, I will have to discuss it among myself or myself, as my book is called, right? Remember that I am the author of Talking to Myself learning to love the voices in your head. All right. So I guess I'll be talking to myself right now, but these are pretty interesting and hopefully somebody will be with me listening either now or later. And I think you'll enjoy these. Okay. So from 1910, the average life expectancy for men was 47 years. 47 years. I mean, think about middle age, right? That's, uh, that's, that's half. My, my dad is now 97. So he's lived twice that already. 
Um, I guess there was a lot of war, but this is before the flu. This is before World War I. This is 1910. Fuel for a car, and I don't know what kind of cars there were in 1910, but they were sold gas, I guess it says fuel, was sold in drugstores, in drugstores. Like what did you do, get a can of something and pour it into the car? Now, when I read that, it made me think about some of the probably movies that I've seen with, with old fashioned, like Great Gatsby or something, you know, with a, an old fashioned gas station. I guess that would have been the 20, 1920s. Um, but didn't they, didn't they say Rexall? Didn't they usually have some kind of Rexall sign around the gas pumps, you know, or in the building where the gas pumps were? So maybe just like, uh, Barbers were the first dentists, right? I think they used to pull teeth, okay? Um, and drugstores were where you got your gas for your car, okay? Only 14% of homes had a bathtub. Now, I was born in the 50s and I don't know how I can remember this, but I, I kind of do remember being bathed in, what did they call it, a bassinet or um, the, the sink at my grandmother's house in, uh, in Queens, in an apartment that may have been built. I don't know, was it built in 1910 uh, in Queens, Regal Park? It might've been. So, it did have a shower and a bathtub too. I think it had a bathtub. But um, did did you do sponge baths in big sinks or that kind of tub? Or I mean, I know that we can think of the eighteen hundreds when you used to. I can picture um, porters or whatever on a train. You know, for rich people, they would be having a bath in some kind of big tub and they'd be pouring the hot water in, gone with the wind. But that seems more like 1800s. That doesn't seem like 1910. So 14%, meaning 86% of households did not have a tub. And I don't know if that means it had a stall shower because they seem like they came later. Claw tubs are what are the old fashioned kind of tubs without showers. So what did they do? Now we know in France, they use a lot of perfume, <laughs> perfume, you know, cause they did not get a chance to bathe that frequently. That's why they smell like perfume. 8% of homes had a telephone and you can imagine what the telephone was like. It would have been the, you know, Madge, can you get me? You know, the little thing you put to your ear and the thing that you talk into and you, you ring it and it was probably a party line, you know, and who knows if everyone went to the person's house who had a phone, if they needed one. Um, I don't know what, maybe everybody you knew was within walking distance. I'm not sure. Um, you just went to their house probably to talk. Let's see. There were only 6,000 cars, 6,000. No wonder you could buy your fuel in a drugstore. There were only 6,000. I don't know how many drugstores there were, but they didn't need to take care of too many cars in 2010. Um, and there were only 144 miles of paved roads with the maximum speed limit in most cities. And I mean, were there cities, paved roads? Were, were things more towns? I guess there were cities, 10 miles an hour. I started talking about driving, 10 miles an hour. I think I would have been honking a lot. <laughs> Although, you know, you walk at about two miles an hour, right? You can go about a half a mile in an hour. So, I guess if you're going five times faster, you're happy. And what do you bicycle? Uh, 
seems like you might be able to bicycle 10 miles an hour. But, well, they did have bicycles built for two back then, too. But cars, I think, might be able to handle more people. I don't know, because what, you had the rumble seat to put people in the back? So you didn't really have too many people in a car either. I'm sure it was status symbol to have a car. I think that now, let's see, my grandmother was born in 1906. um, And I do remember her dad was, he made furniture? I'm not sure if, if that, I mean, I know he made some furniture we had in our house. I am not sure what his actual occupation was, but I think that they were in pretty good shape. And I think they had a car in New York City. Not sure if it was in 1910, she would have only been four then. So I don't know if I heard too many stories about that. Um, Let's see, the tallest structure in the world was the Eiffel Tower. I could believe that. Yeah, in 1910, that would be pretty tall. might have been one of the uh, wonders of the world. The average US wage was 22 cents an hour. And I think money is a real important um, concept that we need. Like, do you know right now everybody's upset because stamps went up to, I believe they went from 63 cents to 66 cents. We all have the forever stamps now, so you don't even really know how much you're paying. And whenever you bought it, you get to keep using it. But if you have to buy any now, they're 66 cents. And I've heard people say, I'm going to stop mailing anything. Well, do you know, we need for one thing to keep the post postal service in business because we would be very unhappy if we did not get mail delivery. What a luxury that we get to just go to a mailbox six days a week. Because remember, they were thinking of getting rid of Saturday delivery. So I think buying stamps is an easy way to try to support the fact that we get mail delivered to us. And I remember having pen pals in other countries when I was a kid and also being in other countries. I went to, um, I went to Europe between, I think it was my freshman and sophomore year, the first time backpacking. Then I actually did a semester in 1974, just after Nixon was impeached. I'm hearing the, uh, the, the, what, 60 years ago stuff or whatever coming in right now. And it was in August and I went to Paris in September. And so there was a lot of political stuff going on there about what do you think? I, I have to do a French accent. What, what do you think about your president now? <laughs> they, they like to uh, razz us about that. And I had to send aerograms. Anyone hear of that? It was this very thin paper, very thin. I I still have some. I also uh, did work. I taught my alchemical hypnotherapy. I did work in New Zealand for four different uh, autumns in the early 90s, 91 through 94, I think it was. Um, And in order to write home. Well, you know, I was so lucky that fax machines were invented sometime during the the four different stints that I did over there. And we could actually have things come instantly through a fax. That was a miracle. But before that, letters took seven to 10 days for you to send it and then for it to come back, and it was expensive, a stamp then, and an ounce, I, I, I think it was an ha- a half an ounce, probably you put a stamp on for, and it was that very, very light, thin paper, you could almost read through it. Um, and yet, postage in other countries is more expensive, just like gasoline in other countries is more expensive. 
and they have what do they call it the not the royal gallon uh something like that canadians and and british have a different when it's the gallon it's not even an american gallon of gas and it is way more expensive so we are spoiled but just think uh, you know, it doesn't say what a stamp was back then. Maybe it was a penny, um, but 22 cents an hour. And the average U.S. worker made between 200 and 400 dollars a year. A year. With 22 cents an hour. And that was when you could actually buy the, you know, the, it's called penny candy, right? You ever go to the penny candy stores or penny arcades? You can play pinball or whatever they had, ski ball. They probably had that back then. Um, and a penny, a penny meant something. Now, I guess that it is actually more expensive to make a penny than it is. Then it's, it's not even, it costs more than a penny to make a penny. So we will probably not have them for very long. And they're pretty worthless these days. So, um, you know, money is a completely different concept now than it was then. And now get this. I love this. 95% of all births were home births. Oh, I'm telling you, like, um, barbers took out your teeth. I don't think they did anything but take them out. You know, they probably had some kind of apparatus to pull it i don't know if they did any more than that i don't think they were dentists but okay and then um 90 percent of all doctors had no college education instead they attended so-called medical schools many of which were condemned in the press and the government as substandard and what's happening now now people are going into debt for medical bills and I mean, just to have a baby. What did I hear from one of my clients? $40,000, I think. They're not American. So to have a baby, it's, it's expensive just to have a baby. Now that could get me on the topic of forced pregnancy because of the abortion issue. And I'll have to, I keep saying, I'll have to talk about that because I will have to talk about that sometime because the whole idea of the birth system is dangerous. And it used to be at home, right? With people who weren't even really doctors. So who did you have? Midwives, you didn't have a bathtub, but they'd say, boil some water and then i guess you put the baby in the sink or the bassinet or whatever to wash them they would fit but you know are we going backwards right now and let's see one more that i have here and then we're going to need to go to break sugar cost four cents a pound for sugar pennies four cents and you actually could buy something. You could buy a pound of sugar. So, okay, I think that is all pretty interesting. And contrast is really important. And we have to know that um, our way is not the only way we forget. We can forget what just happened a couple of weeks ago. Never mind how different it is. What is this? Uh, 103 years ago. This was 1910. Okay, so we are going to go away again and come back. And please stay with me because I will return. Debbie Unterin on Bold Brave TV with Love the Voices. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like 
I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Hello, Debbie Unterman, back with you. Love the voices. So I told you I want to talk a little bit about this functional freeze and its relationship to being regulated as opposed to a dysregulated nervous system and having good attachment and being able to breathe to breathe correctly this is all very important and just coincidentally because i just saw um two or three of these lectures just today but yesterday i was on the phone with my brother and as i was watching one of them about um i think it was about the functional freeze but it might have been more of let's see about attachment i think because they're so connected that i realize that i've talked about and because they kept saying that one of the things that can breach this need you know this ideal attachment is being a preemie, you know, having a hospital stay, being orphaned, but they kept mentioning operations and hospitals. And this, now I was in a hospital for seven days for appendicitis. I was nine. My brother was in for, I don't know how many days, but a few when he was six months. So the idea of being separated from a mother at six months and also having it scare my mother and him. They both got scared. She looked at him and got scared. He wanted her, she ran away. That made him scared. You know, this is all pre, pre-verbal, unconscious, completely. We didn't even know we didn't understand my, my brother and I, we didn't understand why he and I are so different. Like I say, I drive like a maniac, you know, I'm not afraid of anything. I would jump off, well, dive off the high diving board, um, go in the ocean, you know, ride a bike. And we lived on a hill. It was like, woo, the first time I had the training wheels taken off. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to brake correctly and my dad was running down the hill after me and I had to crash myself into some a, a lawn but he didn't even start to to want to ride a bike you know because I don't know maybe he'd fall off maybe he wouldn't be able to do it or I don't know but he did not he just you know everybody everybody said to me oh she's gonna start 
uh, setting her hair in curlers by the time she, they would bet, my friends and their parents would bet, oh, will it be sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade? I never did. Well, we thought he would start riding a bike and he never decided to learn until he decided, I know how, and I'm just gonna get a bike and do it. And he was older by then and he just rode. You know, he had to kind of come to that decision, but he's got this shyness. We've always known that, but now I get that it's a completely dysregulated state. So what happens? He gets a dog. I mean, this is for real. Do you know how, you know, they say you start looking like dogs, like your dog, your pets, you know, you can see a person and their dog next to each other and they kind of start resembling each other. It is a little scary when it's a bulldog, but he has a dog that was a rescue. I had a rescue also, and my dog obviously had some problems. Um, I was telling him on the phone yesterday, I could not hug my dog for more than two seconds. I could count one, two, and she would be wriggling out from under my arms. She, you know, she obviously had something where she was held down. And I know who, you know, because it was, it had to have been a little boy or little boys wearing backpacks on bicycles, because as soon as a little boy with a backpack or on a bicycle would come by, she would freak out. So these things stay in the nervous system. So my brother, Steve has a dog named Bruno, who is so sweet. Everybody loves him. And we talked about maybe him being a, um, a service dog, you know, going to hospitals or something. He never did do that. And now he's probably not that Steve's too old, but the dog is right too old to teach a, an old dog new tricks. But what we've always known is that he's very, very afraid of thunder and fireworks. And so I've talked to him about getting him like a thunder jacket, which he tried, I think something like that. It helps a little, but I said, what about, you know, when he's freaking out, when there's a thunderstorm or something or fireworks, um, do you, do you hold him? Do you sit with him and pet him? And he said, no, it makes it, worse. Well, what do we know about the freeze state? I'm saying it like I've been teaching you and you're following along. And if you have been over these last few months, maybe you remember that what the freeze state needs is to discharge the frozenness. And what does that look like? it looks like shaking. So now I can tell a story, a couple of stories about myself. One is that I, I, I took a Chinese medicine course just before coming to Atlanta from California. It was the last thing I did in California. I knew that it would be a really good combination to have my alchemical hypnotherapy certification and also a Chinese medicine certification in the meridians, not doing acupuncture, but acupressure. So one time while I was being worked on, and I believe it was my teacher doing the work, I, I think I ended up with a crowd around me because I started shaking, shaking, you know, those fake teeth that, chattering teeth. I could hear them in my own ears. I could hear my teeth chattering like that. And I could not stop. I didn't know this was 1988. That's when I got here. And I took that course and pretty much drove away after that June, uh, May of, of 88. I didn't know what was going on. No one knew what was going on. But I just shook and shook and shook on the table. And now I know that it was discharging this freeze state. And they're talking about if you have this functional freeze, you're kind of living in the free state. And one way to know is if you don't cry. Now that's 
all in my book. Anybody that knows me knows that I did not cry for like 30 years. Um, I think when I found out someone died, I think I remember crying and, you know, there might've been a couple of times, but basically I couldn't cry. That's what I would call it. I couldn't cry. They, they say either if you cry too much, like at the drop of a hat, you can't stop crying. Or if you can't cry, you are probably a, a victim of the functional freeze. And I'm sure I was from the fact that I, you know, I did get punished. I have a a mouth that when I need to say something, I say it and it didn't always go over so well with my father. Whereas Steve would not say it. And he would he'd say to me, why do you do that? You know, you're going to get in trouble. Why don't you just stay quiet? Like, well, I still don't stay quiet. That's just who I am, who I've always been. But remember, I also told a story when Bird Smith Lyon was on with me about how these tears about never having a baby, a baby sister, because my mother had two miscarriages, and then never having a baby, never holding a baby, never being around a baby, just absolutely missed out on babies. And I did not know how how much it hurt me until I'm in one of Burge's workshops and I am crying uncontrollably. Well, what they're saying, I want to get back to my brother and his dog, but what they're saying about this functional freeze state is that you have to gradually let it unwind and as things come up and that you never know. And they say, the time when they will probably come up are when you are around people or someone because you have to be co-regulated before you can self-regulate if you're dysregulated you need to co-regulate and you need a person to help you and also you need to feel safe so when did i feel safe in a workshop with all my friends and with Burge. so all of a sudden I'm doing this inner child meditation. And the next thing I know, I'm uncontrollably crying about something that was from 50 years ago that I didn't even know was in my bones. And so I'm going to come back and tell you about the advice I'm giving my brother about his dog. Because just like you can start looking like your dog. They also come to heal you. They, they have matching issues. And sometimes they will have something before you do. And you get to kind of practice it with them, you know, having them come up with something. Then you like, let's say cancer. Then you find out you have it. They can actually mimic our medical issues so okay we're gonna go away just for another minute or so we're gonna come back and i'm gonna finish this story author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hello, Debbie Unterman again, in the middle of a story about my brother Steve and his dog Bruno. So as I'm listening to this, uh, this lecture, this class, 
on a, a videotape, you know, online yesterday, <clears throat> all of a sudden it hit me that we were talking, you know, I've been talking to him about his dog having these, you know, just going crazy when it, obviously July 4th, New Year's Eve, you know, when there's fireworks, but thunderstorms, he lives in Denver, there's thunderstorms. Thunder can happen anytime. So I said, I, I have a feeling because this discharge is this shaking and that's what his dog does. And then I find out that it gets worse before it gets better when you feel safe, right? Just what, like they, they use the example of a, a woman that might have five jobs working really hard. And it's when she finally like catches up and is ready to retire or whatever, you know, and she's not working so hard. That's when her stuff starts coming up. Because if you stay busy and you don't have time for it, you can push it down like we do. But <clears throat> when you have finally time to rest, you feel safe and you're around people. You have to co-regulate. All of a sudden I realize Bruno is in Steve's life for a reason. It's a matching issue. He has a dog that, that shakes and is scared. And I ask him, so what do you do for it? Do you hold him? He says, no, it makes it worse. So that's when I had to call him up and go, do it, do it. When, when next time there's thunder. And so now I'll have to get back to you because there hasn't been since I just told him to do this yesterday. And I did get permission for me to be able to talk about this. He gave me permission. Don't think I'm talking about him without his permission. I always ask. I said, be there with him. <clears throat> and you know, I always talk about like prosodic voice, the prosody of the voice. That's baby talk. That's when you say, oh, you're such a good boy. Whether it's a little boy, a baby or a dog. I want him to be there with Bruno, touching him petting him, letting him shake and not letting him, you know, not letting him it scare Steve that, oh no, it's worse. It's like when I was, you know, shaking while they were working on me and I couldn't stop, but I realized now I was discharging or when I finally had these tears come out 50 years later, because it was time, I felt safe. What Bruno needs is for Steve to be with him using the prosodic voice, telling him, that's good, you're a good boy. And, you know, petting his head, maybe holding him, because he's not like my sunshine where he won't let him hold him. And I said, even if you're just touching his paw, you know, if there's this like teeny little touch and, and that's all you're doing is you're touching his paw and he knows you're there because they've done studies in MRIs and they've shown that women calm down, their heart rate goes down if they're just shown a picture of their husband while they're in an MRI. But imagine if you could be holding hands with someone it calms the nerves. So now we're going to experiment. We're going to see if he is there while he allows the dog to shake even more, if it then gets better and lessens. And maybe Bruno will lick him, you know, in his face or something while he's there to let him know that he appreciates this. And we're going to try something new. And I think that they might be healers for each other. I think animals come to us to heal us. And I don't think it's an accident that he would have a matching issue like that. Um, my dog, when I first got her, had a little cyst in, in her head, just about like that, that was a, you know, had to be operated on. It was an abscess that she got in the pound. And she had a scar from then on 
uh, after they did the operation, she had a scar uh, on her head, you know, on her face. Like I have acne scars. I don't think that was an accident either. So I'm going to have to go very quickly. What I want to say also is that the breath is magical and that I'm going to give you a quick technique because I learned that it is highly suggested, like vital, that we breathe through our nose, that we do nose breathing. And there's a trick. Now, my tongue does it automatically, I notice. It, but your tongue should go to the roof of your mouth and kind of just the tip of your tongue kind of touch your teeth. And if it does that, it prevents mouth breathing. So that's the tip I want to give you to practice deep breathing. There are so many health benefits. It even got into the fact that the Framingham study on the heart, and that's where we grew up in Framingham, Massachusetts, and they have an ongoing heart study. It's called the Framingham study, and it's the longest ever. They follow people. I know it was 40 years. Maybe it's been 60 by now. And they found that lung health is the most important factor to heart health. And to breathe through the nose, they, I also learned the reason for breathing is to eliminate carbon dioxide. It's all about the exhale. And that if you breathe through your mouth, it's harder to exhale the carbon dioxide because somehow it's heavier to get the air in through your mouth than through your nose. So that's the last tip I am leaving you with today is you can exhale through your mouth, but definitely inhale through your nose. There was even a thing he calls mouth taping with a little strip this way, not to torture you, but to sleep better and to keep your mouth shut and do nose breathing while you sleep too. And I'm saying all of this is connected. Dysregulation and the this new, this functional freeze, this walking around in this free state that needs to be discharged and the breath and attachment. It's all from wrong early kind of, uh, parenting that didn't know any better. And they told you to just, it's okay that you just fell down. Just, just let it go. It's okay. You don't have to cry about it. Be a big boy. That was wrong. Okay. So I am leaving you telling you that was wrong. It's good to cry. It's good to laugh. It's good to tear. It's good to play and belly laugh and nose breathe and shake and discharge and it's going to come out at maybe the most inopportune time but it's all for your greater good and health so this is debbie unterman signing off from love the voices on bold brave tv i will see you again next thursday six o'clock eastern time and otherwise you can watch me on your favorite streaming network Bye for now. This has been Love the Voices with host Debbie Unterman. Tune in each week as Debbie will keep you engaged, enlightened, and entertained as she delves into cutting-edge topics and challenges widely held beliefs. Thursdays, 6 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.